Try keeping all these kids in order. <laughs> Good excuse today. Welcome to those who are joining us uh, online. We're delighted to have you with us. It is a July 4th weekend and some of our folks are out of town, but we've got some visiting with us and we're thrilled to have them with us. I was mentioning in our introductory comments that the Apostle Paul is a, is a real deep theologian. He wrote much of the New Testament. Many of his uh, letters comprise the bulk of our New Testament. And in particular, Paul wrote an eschatological treatise that's found in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And it's quite uh, heavy duty. It is a cluster of scripture that is very, very challenging. If you don't get well grounded in the overall context of the book of Romans and eschatologically, when you come to Romans 9, 10, and 11, it will make your head spin. Even Peter, an apostle himself, said about Paul, uh, referring to his many letters, and Peter wrote about eschatology too in 2 Peter 3, but he said about Paul's writings that some things were hard to understand. Sometimes people say, quit talking about eschatology, it's too hard. Well, it's in scripture. And if you feel it's hard to understand, well, you're not alone because even Peter, the apostle, acknowledged that some of Paul's writings were hard to understand. But they're biblical and we have to work our way through them. I'm not talking about eschatology today, but I'm just kind of springboarding into our sermon for this morning, which is not really heavy duty, but it's really practical. Throughout Paul's rabbinic training, he went to school to be a rabbi. He advanced beyond his peers, meaning that he was one of the best students the rabbis had ever encountered. And despite his being a highly educated theologian, though, the Apostle Paul has that rare ability to be so scholarly but he also excelled in actuating the gospel of Christ as a way of life. <clears throat> in other words, Christianity is not some theorem to be analyzed in a laboratory somewhere. It is a prescription for how to live, how to follow Jesus. So after Paul wraps up this deep discussion of God's providence, in intertwining the Jews and the Gentiles in God's scheme of redemption, Paul then turns his attention to practical matters. That's what we find in Romans chapter 12. It begins in a very poetic way, but it ends up just being one statement after another that is so simple. You don't have to be a deep theologian to understand it. For example, Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and following. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. <clears throat> Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The Lord. That's from the New American Standard. The NIV says of Romans 12 and verse 11, never be lacking in zeal. Or the James Moffat, which is a paraphrase, says of the same verse, never let your zeal lag. Maintain the spiritual glow, serving the Lord. This morning, in case you haven't guessed, we're talking about zeal. We have been in an extended series. I don't know how many have been in our lesson now. And I appreciate the feedback from many of you. You've been very encouraging. Um, and I, I, that helps, that spurs us on. But in this series, I've just been trying to talk plainly. You know, one thing about being semi-retired or almost retired is that, uh, you can just shuck it the way it is. And if, without sounding too uh, out of line here, if somebody doesn't like the truth that they're hearing, they can fire you. <laughs> a 
but I'm going to be gone soon enough anyway. I mean, I'm not leaving, but I'm going to be retired soon enough. So it gives us kind of, as Vic and I were talking recently, a sense of liberty. There's a sense of freedom where I'm not walking on eggshells trying to not offend anybody. I'm just trying to tell you what the Word of God says. And so here I am late in my ministry, and I've told you this over and over again, but I, I want to tell you again what it means, how important it is to follow Jesus. That's what we're all about. And there are many different uh, images that are used to talk about taking on the mind of Christ, or Paul even refers to the aroma or the fragrance of Christ. Sometimes we hear the term, the mark of a Christian. One that is popular that we've uh, referenced many times is Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And Peter as well makes a list of some Christian virtues in the online notes I've given you all of these references. Well, in Paul's list that we read about in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, all of these things, you don't find the word zeal there. That's our subject today. We want to talk about zeal. I don't think that we can really represent Jesus in our world today without being zealous. Uh, I don't think we can follow in the steps of Jesus without having zeal. And as I said at the initial beginning of this series, which was really given birth by a, a little series that Tracy taught us, we were wanting to talk not only about Christian disciplines, but I wanted to talk to us about some of these fruit of the Spirit. And I told you at the very outset that I wanted to dig a little deeper because there's a lot of things that we need to have as part of our Christian makeup that are not enumerated in Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit, nor are they listed by Peter as one of the virtues that we're to add to our faith, but they're virtues and they're fruit of the Spirit nonetheless. And this is one of those. I don't think you can find, there are several different virtue lists in the New Testament. I don't think you'll find this list on any of them, but you find it kind of punctuated here and there in several of the different writings. And this is one of those places where we find it, where Paul mentions this, and we'll quote from him again in just a moment. Zeal has been defined as this, focused desire characterized by passion and commitment. Now, do you see where I would say you can't be a Christian without this? Zeal, we have to have, we have to be zealous. And if you're not, I would tell you like John told the church at Laodicea and the church at Ephesus, wake up. This has to be a part of your character. As we've said all along in the series, I'm not, I'm not telling you go to these virtue lists and just pick one or two that you'd like to cultivate. I think we're expected to have them all. And I know it's a tall order. You can't just say, well, I'm going to have love, joy, and peace, but I don't want to do anything with kindness and patience. You have to have all of them. They all, have to all, they all work in uh, concert with each other. So zeal is one of these that maybe it's uh, not seen in the list, but it's really a high priority character. And it speaks about a really deep down fervency, or the word is ardor, or maybe the word that you would like to use is the word enthusiasm. Are you enthusiastic for the cause of Christ? Are you ardorous? Do you bubble about it? Zeal is a word that describes many of the Old Testament saints. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, the writer there, who I think is Paul, he enumerates a whole list of people. In chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and the cloud of witnesses is all of those Old Testament characters that Paul is imagining or watching these first century saints. And so in chapter 11, he talks about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Adam and Joseph and Moses and Rahab even and Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets. 
And he's not meaning to uh, leave out anybody to hurt their feelings. I mean, you notice Daniel's not even in this list. He doesn't say anything about Elijah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. And so a bunch of people are left out of the list, but Paul's not meaning it to be an all-inclusive. He's just remembering the faith of some of these great ones of times gone by. And he says about them that these, by faith, here's what he said, they conquered kingdoms. They performed acts of righteousness, all of these things by faith. They obtained promises. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness, they were made strong. They became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured not accepting their release in order that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others, he writes, and this is Hebrews 11.32 through the end of the chapter, he says, others experience mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted. They were ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, the writer says, wandering about in caves and holes in the ground. And the writer says all of these did that by faith. But I'm standing before you to tell you this morning that their faith was accompanied by great zeal. Read their stories and you'll see it. It jumps off the pages. Jesus entered into our world as a newborn baby. And he grew into manhood, as you know, throughout his incarnation time. Jesus' first recorded miracle was that wedding feast in Cana of Galilee where he turned water into wine. That's John chapter 2 and verse 11. And the Bible goes on to tell us there in John 2 that from there, from Cana, they went on to uh, Capernaum. His mothers and his brothers and his disciples went to Capernaum and they stayed for a few days. And then uh, chapter 2 continues and tells us that Jesus went on to Jerusalem to attend the Passover feast. This was to worship in the Jewish temple. And while he was there, maybe you remember this story, he did something that was very unusual, especially for Jesus. You might even call it radical. Do you remember the story? Upon entering the temple, he saw money changers who had set up their shop and they were price gouging the pilgrims traveling from all over the Roman Empire to be in Jerusalem to worship, who needed to come in and get currency exchange so that they could buy the sheep or the dove or the oxen, whatever they needed to make a sacrifice. And when Jesus came into the temple and he saw these money changers taking advantage of all of these travelers, you couldn't bring all these sacrifices with you. So when you got there, you had to buy your doves or your oxen or your sheep. And these guys set up their money changers and they would say, okay, you give me 75 cents and I'll give you 50 cents back. So they were profiting from the great zeal of the pilgrims who were traveling a long way with their families to come to Jerusalem. So there Jesus saw this and he, we see from Jesus, a very fiery disposition. The Bible tells us he made a scourge of cords and he drove out the money changers, pouring out their coins, overturning their tables. And he said to them, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. And this event caused his apostles to remember a messianic prophecy that was wedged back in the writings of the psalm where David had once prophesied. It's found in Psalm 69 and verse 9. David said when the Messiah come, would come that he would say, zeal 
zeal for my house has possessed me or consumed me. This is Jesus. And this is how he explains what somebody might say was a loss of his temper. No, it wasn't. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was probably quite calm in doing it. But he says, zeal for my Lord's house consumes me. And he says then, essentially, I'm not going to tolerate that. I love God too much to stand back and do nothing. Jesus lived zestfully. I'm not sure what the definition of that word is. I think it's very close to the concept of zeal. Jesus constantly glowed with zeal. I know he had sad times, and I know there were down times and quiet times, but if we say anything about Jesus, he was a man who lived zestfully, who was full of zeal. These two things are interrelated. He possessed a joy that could not be overshadowed, even all of the events of the cross. Remember Hebrews 12 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You couldn't rob Jesus of his joy, nor of his zeal. And we see this in so many areas, and I'll hasten in mentioning some of these. Sometimes we see this zeal in the words that he spoke, things that seem kind of almost contradictory, where he would say, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, Matthew 5, 3, or Blessed are the meek, he would say in Matthew 5 and verse 5. And he would often tell others, be of good cheer. That was Jesus talking. That's the Jesus who's full of zeal. And Jesus often urged his disciples to seek after that inward glow, exhorting them to be, of all things, this is probably his most popular metaphor, he said to them, this is in Matthew chapter 6, he said to his followers, he said, you, really we could read it, you are to be. You are the salt of the earth. You remember that? You're the salt of the earth. He said the light of the world too, but the salt of the earth is what he said. And we all know that Salt has a lot of valuable usages. It can purify, it can preserve, but it also flavors and enhances in a very delightful way. I know we can use too much of it, but it's a wonderful ingredient to add to our life. So here Jesus uses this image of being the salt of the earth. One, I have a lot of old books in my library and sometimes I pull one off the shelf shelf and I start reading from it and I think, why haven't I read from this before? It's really, really a, a, an older book. And this is the case with this one. And it's written by a guy named Clovis Chapel. And here's what he says, perhaps the richest meaning that Jesus put into this great word is that to be a Christian is to find the secret of zest. To be a Christian is to find the secret of zest. And then he goes on, and I love this kind of language. He said it's to find a tang, T-A-N-G, to find a tang in the feast of life and to be able to give that tang to others. I want you to quote me later on that, okay? Cloak Chapel. Without the salt of Christian char character, life really does become a little bit insipid. Back when I was sick for a while and I lost a bunch of weight and part of it was just nothing, nothing tasted good. We were at Sidney Jean and Isaiah's and they'd be cooking away and I'd lay in bed and I just want to run away. Every smell made me sick. Nothing tasted good. Everything was insipid. And then I started getting better and I kept telling Jeannie fix how oh, I think of some of her favorite meals that she fixed for me and she'd fix them and I'd just sit there and say, it's, it's not the same. It doesn't taste very good at all. Insipid is the word. Now let's translate that into our Christian life. What good are we to the world if we claim to be salt, but we're nothing but insipid? Part of what Jesus wants us to do is to infuse 
the world around us to make it so delightful and so flavorful. So let me close with just a few practical things. <clears throat> Zeal comes to us, I think, in a multitude of ways. It's in a joy for worship. Gary and Sue are camping north of us here. They wanted to come to worship this morning. They could have gone elsewhere, but we're glad they came with us. And it reminds us, and some of you, uh, I think some of the Wildman clan was out camping, and they left their campsite to come here this morning. And it reminds us of, what did David say? I was glad when they said to me, let's go up to the house of the Lord. That's zeal. If you want to know how you're doing in the category of zeal, if you don't feel much like going to church, you need to do some work. If you find yourself waking up on Sunday or perhaps even anticipating Sunday throughout the week and saying, I can't wait to be at church again, you're, you're doing good with your zeal. Our interest in singing. Jeannie has a good friend who does uh, physical therapy work or uh, uh, occupational therapy work with patients all over, many, many, uh, mainly Mahoning County and Columbia County. And one of her patients, uh, uh, for some reason, Jeannie's friend uh, went to church with one of uh, her patients. Maybe it was part of her ther therapy plan. I don't know. But it was a Church of Christ. I'll not tell you which one. But Stacy had worshiped with us on several occasions. And Stacy came back and she said, I like the way you guys sing better than the way they sing. And the implication was they didn't sing. You go to worship and you expect, hey, let's sing praises of God, but then nobody sings. I would say something's wrong with our zeal when that happens. So when we come together and we want to open, let's see, I think I hear Paul saying, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's an expression of zeal. I'm not going to sit in judgment on you if you don't sing. For, you know, I got throat trouble sometimes, and sometimes I just think I better save my voice, and I sit there and I don't sing, and you might have a legitimate reason to do so, but if your normal procedure is to come in here and sit down and not sing, get with it. Singing is an expression of zeal. How can we do that? How can you come together in the presence of God and not want to... Shout joy to the Lord. You don't have to shout like the kids. You can say amen without saying it the way the boys do here up here. I think we express it by our fellowship. We love to be together. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they were continually devo devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Engaging in good works. If you're not engaged in good works, Titus chapter 2 verse 7 says to show yourself an example of good deeds. And then he says later on, a few verses later, here's the word, be zealous for good deeds. If you don't have a real hankering to be engaged in doing good deeds, you've got zeal trouble. Our eagerness to give. Paul told the Christians in Achaia, he said, the Macedonians, you have your generosity, your zeal in giving to the cause of Christ has stirred up those who are in Macedonia. It's almost like they want to rise up and match you in their giving. Our sharing the gospel. Vic talked about this in Bible class this morning. Romans chapter 10 and verse 18 says, Paul says their voice, meaning he's quoting the Old Testament, and their, the Old Testament is foreseeing a time when the early church would take the gospel and spread it everywhere. And the Old Testament writer says their voice has gone out into all the earth. Has it? Oh, 
oh, there's a lot to say about this, but I have to touch on one more thing, and this is maybe on my mind and on the minds of many of us. Our stand against immorality. That's an expression of our zeal. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, let everyone who names the name of the Lord, can you finish it? Abstain from wickedness. We, in case you have not noticed it, we are in the midst of a cultural war. And you may not realize it, but we're fighting for our life. And sometimes it, it doesn't look too good for our side. Just because some of our national leaders are promoting a month of pride doesn't mean that I have to acquiesce. Acquiesce is a big word. It just means agree without dissent. There's things that are flying under that banner that everybody wants to say, oh, let's just be nice and be kind. And we should always be nice and be kind. And I'm not urging that we be strident or ugly. There's no place for that. But there are times where we can just say, that's enough. I'm not, I'm not going to be quiet about that anymore. And maybe it's not so much just standing up and saying it with our voice. It's voting with our feet. Some of you have decided you're not going to shop at a certain place because of their promotions that you're seeing. That You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. When I was a teenager, everybody knew about sexual immorality. Everybody knew. It was, it was kind of black and white. If you ask the average teenager today, would you define sexual immorality? How would they define it based upon what they're being fed by a lot of adults? There is no sexual immorality anymore. That's the, almost the conclusion you draw to. All right, I'm going to stop on that. But I'm saying here that sadly, far too many believers have become absent or truant in voicing disapproval concerning immoral behavior. I know, I know we live in a, an America that's a pluralistic society. And that's a fancy way of saying everybody has a right to believe what they want to believe on their own. And they do. And we can't legislate against them. But we don't have to agree. And we don't have to be silent. And we certainly don't have to affirm what they're believing. I thought the other day, wouldn't it be terrific if all of a sudden Congress or the Senate or the President or somebody said, hey, we're going to have a, a month of zeal. We're going to have a month of zeal where everybody who believes in God and make it an, uh, such a umbrella that is, it doesn't have to be just Christians, it can be whoever, but anybody that wants to recognize God and honor God, this is a month to celebrate zeal. We can never do that in this country anymore. Not publicly. We can surely do it quietly. I'm saying that to tell you we're further down the road than we imagine. And you know that's true. Because it was only a few years ago that some of us started seeing some things like this on TV. And we said, what? And now it's everywhere. And it's that way by design. And part of the reason it's everywhere is because some of us have just kind of said, well. And we say nothing. And again, I'm not encouraging anybody to be mean or ugly or nasty. We always have to be loving and kind. But I kind of remember a scripture that says, speak the truth in love. And we're capable of doing that. Well, one more thing. How can we maintain this level of zeal for the Lord? 
And I, I cannot honestly tell you that once you find zeal, it, you'll always have it. That's just not, it's just not that easy. And in fact, Paul's own language in Romans 12, 11 implies that we might find ourselves from time to time lagging in zeal or lacking zeal. So we find that many times throughout our lives, <clears throat> we have to rekindle the flame. We have to stir up the fire. Oh, a lot of this makes us think of camp, doesn't it? Camp was a great summer recharge over the years, but that still that same spirit needs to be with us that, yeah, we're gonna have to stir the flames and spark the fire, but so what? That's part of life in Christ. And one way we do that is to associate with others who can help stimulate us or provoke us to love and good deeds. And then we pray often for renewal. When was the last time you, you asked God, help me to be strong again, to be full of zeal, maybe like I used to be? It's a powerful lesson. We can say well, we can work without zeal, but we can't. If we don't get caught up with zeal, we're the walking dead. It's just a matter of time. But if we become in, infused with zeal, with the zeal for the Lord, there is no telling what this small congregation can do in the name of the Lord. Let's bow together in prayer.